webinar. There are participants who are present here, um, although you can't see them on the screen, they're actually, um, they've joined us. So um, hello everyone and um, welcome. Uh, my name is Shata Bisha Shetty. I'm the director of the Asia Pacific Leadership Network. Uh, thank you for joining us. And I'm really pleased to welcome you uh, to this online webinar and launch of the final report in our joint collaborative project focused on helping leaders and policymakers identify ways to prevent nuclear weapons use and nuclear escalation on the Korean Peninsula and in Northeast Asia. Uh, today, we have a strong lineup of experts uh, here to speak with you about the analysis and the findings of this work. Firstly, Dr. Peter Hayes, uh, the Executive Director of the Nautilus Institute, will be briefly giving some background on the overall research project itself and the use case approach that we adopted to better understand the plausible pathways that could lead to the first use of nuclear weapons. After that, Eva Lazowski, who is an independent consultant in nuclear weapons effects modeling and nuclear accident simulations, uh, and a co-author of our project's second year report, will be speaking about the modeling work uh, that was conducted in year two of the project, where we estimated the fatalities and health effects of nuclear weapons use using high split simulations and geographical data. After that, we have Dr. Van Jackson, a senior lecturer in international relations at Victoria University of Wellington, and formerly a US policymaker at the Pentagon. Van will be describing the analysis and policy recommendations in the final project report of which he is the main author. Then we will have brief comments uh, from uh, Professor John Bongyun, Professor Emer Emeritus at the Korea National Diplomatic Academy, uh, Dr. Tong Zhao, Senior Fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and Professor uh, Kazuku Hikawa, the Vice Director at the Research Center for Nuclear Weapons Abolition at Nagasaki University. After that, we will open up the discussion uh, for comments and questions. Uh, during the uh, presentations, we will add links to each of the reports in the chat box so that you can uh, have access to the material that we're referring to. And if you have any questions or comments, uh, please add them to the Q&A box. Um, and also feel free to tweet uh, APLN on our Twitter account, uh, and we will be able to respond to, uh, to questions and comments uh, here um, as well. And with that, I will now turn to Peter Hayes. Peter. Thank you very much, Shatter. And I'm just going to share my screen. Where is it down there? Huh. Thanks very much, uh, Shatter. And uh, I'd like to just very briefly describe the uh, work of the Reducing the Risk of Nuclear Weapons Use in Northeast Asia project, uh, which was a collaboration between the Research Center for Nuclear Weapons Abolition at Nagasaki University, the Asia Pacific Leadership Network uh, for Nuclear Nonproliferation Disarmament and the Nautilus Institute for Security and Sustainability here in Berkeley in California. And I'd particularly like to acknowledge and thank uh, professors Fumihiko Yoshida and Tatsuhiro Suzuki for their support for this project. Uh, it enabled us to work with RECNA and really to try and uh, spell out the very strong message that uh, we should let Nagasaki remain the last. Uh, never again should nuclear weapons be used. That was the spirit in which this project was undertaken because we set out to really understand the risk of nuclear war and the consequences of a plausible set of use cases of nuclear weapons in the region of Northeast Asia, and particularly involving Korea, to then calculate the effects, the consequences, and then draw the policy implications in year three. And it's a terrible thing to think through what it is to actually use a nuclear weapon. It's uh, mentally challenging, it's ethically challenging, and without the encouragement of RECNA and their colleagues at Nagasaki, 
we would not and could not have undertaken this work. And I just want to acknowledge that up front. The three final synthesis reports of these three years of work are now available online. Uh, and many of the expert papers that informed the three years of work are available at the Journal for Peace and Nuclear Disarmament, which has now become one of the authoritative reference scholarly journals in this field. You can look up those studies uh, as you need. Project set out to figure out under what conditions might nuclear weapons be used intentionally or not intentionally, and by whom, how such escalation might be triggered, who might be involved in responding, and then how the conflict in that pathway evolves and ends. And then, of course, in year two and three, the consequences and policy implications. As we all know in this region, it is already a complex, multilateral uh, kind of uh, threat scenario. There are four nuclear weapon states involving thousands of nuclear weapons, some in the region, some external, but aimed at the region. And then there are two non-nuclear states that have a high degree of latency that they could proliferate nuclear weapons quite quickly if they chose to. Uh, even though they're committed to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, we know that this could happen quickly. And there's been serious discussion of this in both uh, Japan and South Korea, those two non-nuclear states. And there's a third, quote-unquote, non-state, Taiwan, that similarly has the capacity and indeed a past nuclear proliferation program that might in the future uh, re-engage uh, in this particular uh, form of, of uh, geopolitical uh, strategy. In year one, we developed 27 use cases with variants on each, all of which were judged by the diverse set of uh, experts involved in the year one project as being plausible. And we stopped at 27 because there was no point in developing more. We'd already covered a wide range and scale uh, um, uh, of use of nuclear weapons. Uh, and uh, these were all envisioned to occur before 2030 to use nuclear weapons already in existence or near deployment. Uh, and generally, we assumed that targets would be military, not cities or population uh, targets. These are the 27 use cases mapped uh, on the vertical axis to type of use, intentional or uh, inadvertent, and then on the horizontal axis, the target, whether it's urban, civilian, or military uh, on the horizontal axis. And as you can see, uh, when we laid these out on this taxonomy, there was a fairly wide variety. And then in year two, uh, uh, we selected only five of these, which had sufficient diversity uh, in them to really uh, provide good examples across a wide range of circumstances, these being used by a non-state actor or terrorists, uh, the North Korean use, uh, US use, uh, and Russian use as a war in the Ukraine uh, spreads east, uh, and China first use in the case of a Taiwan Straits scenario. I'm going to let Ava Lazowski, uh, my colleague, uh, actually explain what happened in some of those scenarios and the horrific consequences. But I just want to give a few reflections based on this three years of work uh, by a very large number of people. And I say these are my reflections, I should say. The first is it was remarkably easy to come up with plausible first use cases that were judged to be plausible by experts, including active duty nuclear weaponeers, all the way to um, the survivors of nuclear attack at Nagasaki uh, and Hiroshima. What I found interesting is that some policymakers, even in our own networks, responded to this, this set of nuclear uh, use pathways by suggesting that we select the quote unquote, most probable cases that we should pull those out and focus on those because we could somehow 
better manage these risks because we had enough information to estimate the probability. And the problem, in my view, is that this means these decision makers don't really get it yet. They are complacent or they're trapped in the illusion of control. The essence of 27 use cases being rather easily generated is that there's tremendous amount of uncertainty. There are the unknown and unknowable events that will coincide, that will cascade, that will concatenate into pathways. And we truly cannot know in advance what they are. What we can do is anticipate them and undertake measures to reduce the velocity of es escalation that will occur when such triggers uh, uh, bring about um, the use of nuclear weapons or the near use. And that in my view, reducing the speed of escalation is the overarching imperative uh, that should inform many of our strategies and policy measures precisely to enable decision makers who are standing at the brink to think before leaping over the precipice into nuclear war. I also conclude that the situation in this region is less stable and more dangerous than most nuclear decision makers appreciate, and that we don't stand on what they view to be the bedrock of stable nuclear deterrence, but rather on a strategic quicksand that could lead to very early first nuclear use escalation and loss of control with cataclysmic consequences. And on that cheerful note, I'll hand it over to the next speaker. Great. Thank you for that, Peter. I will now turn to Ava Lazowski. Ava. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you, Peter and Shata. Um, and to follow up on the year one introduction provided by Dr. Hayes, I'll summarize the work we did in year two of the project. So in the project's second year, um, as Peter already introduced, we selected five use cases for quantitative evaluation. And these use cases involve most of the potential nuclear weapon users in Northeast Asia, and they vary widely in the number of um, nuclear bombs that were involved in the scenario and stem from different uh, triggering events. And the five use cases we evaluated are shown on this slide. So just briefly, I'll introduce the details of them. Use case one is more of a limited exchange of nuclear weapons, starting with a demonstration detonation by the DPRK with the US responding. And use case two uh, starts with US attack on the DPRK in an attempt to destroy the DPRK's nuclear weapons, but it expands uh, into many counterattacks on industrial and military targets and gets relatively out of control. Uh, use case three is a terrorist attack on a major urban area with a nuclear weapon from an unknown source. Uh, use case four starts with an attack by Russia on U.S. military assets in the area, followed by U.S. counterattacks on Russian military bases. And use case five starts with a conventional attack by China on Taiwan that spreads to a greater nuclear conflict in the region as the U.S. and China um, escalate into another, uh, yet another larger scale nuclear war. And use case two and five could easily have expanded into a larger global nuclear war. Um, but even with the limited capabilities of modeling, uh, we, we only could lim uh, model so many detonations. But in this case, we can already see how uncontrollable these two scenarios have become. Um, and for each detonation of a nuclear weapon in each of the five use cases, this slide shows use case two as an example. So we evaluated the number of people who would likely be killed by a set of overlapping impacts. So fundamentally, there's a blast overpressure, meaning a typhoon strength winds that topple buildings, both large and small. Uh, heat, thermal or thermal heat e equivalent to that of a thousand suns delivered within a fraction of a second, causing fires and burns and firestorms in some cases, which are ignited by heat from the nuclear blast and encircled by high winds consuming everything within their perimeter as happened in Hiroshima and really virtually destroying uh, the entire area and eliminating any, ch any possible chance of survival there could have been. 
um, direct radiation that can cause death in hours, days, and weeks, the coming next weeks, or cancer even years later. Um, and we are fortunate to have the guidance of Professor Takamura of the University of Nagasaki in estimating cancer deaths and, of, and also radiation from windborne fallout. This slide shows the estimated deaths from all of these types of impacts in the 18 explosions that occurred in use case two. These cases we evaluated, uh, the other use cases it resulted in tens of thousands to even millions of deaths in the months following an attack and sometimes millions of additional deaths from cancer years later. Um, and although the lethality of shown in these cases was not surprising to us, uh, it was clear that the use of nuclear weapons on even the most remote targets or even only military targets um, can kill hundreds of thousands of civilians and that other countries can be quickly drawn into and escalate a nuclear conflict in ways that cannot be easily predicted or expected. And next, we simulated the dispersion of radioactive nuclear materials from the explosions, which can travel large distances based on wind and weather patterns. Um, fallout deposition can travel across international boundaries and even into nuclear weapon free zones, bringing non-nuclear weapon states into the conflict. And for each use case, the four day fallout dispersion was simulated using the high split atmospheric transport model. This image shows the simulated radiation dose exposure to the population caused by use case two. It can be seen that there are attacks on uh, attacks on southern China, the eastern United States, and the Korean Peninsula crossed international borders into Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar, Taiwan, the Caribbean, uh, and southern Japan, and even others were affected by low to mid-level radiation dose levels. Even low levels of nuclear fallout can cause public fear and increase political tensions, even if the uh, health effects in the long term are are relatively small. And here is an overall summary of the five use cases that we simulated. Um, and one kind of important thing that we investigated was the additional impact due to firestorms, which are really understudied in the modern uh, way that people estimate the impacts of nuclear weapons. So we tried to quantify in our best guess how how much worse the fire the uh, effect of a firestorm impact could cause to the casualty uh, rate. So, and it turned out to be quite terrible in some cases. And so uh, I'll end my summary there. Thank you. Thank you, Ava. And if anyone has any uh, comments and questions relating to Peter or Ava's presentations about the year one and year two uh, work, please feel free to add them to the, the Q&A box. Um, I'll now turn to uh, Van Jackson. Van. Okay, hopefully you can see that. Okay, cool. Hello, fellow humans. Um, so for many of us, it feels like the world's falling apart, you know. We're definitely not in the unipolar moment anymore. And unfortunately, nuclear weapons are a big part of that story. And the reality isn't like so far from the scenarios that we analyzed and modeled, right? So since 2017, there have been four major confrontations involving nuclear powers. You know, the North Korean nuclear crisis, which, you know, looms large for all of us who study Northeast Asia, of course. Uh, but then in 2020, we had India and China both nuclear powers clashing in the Himalayas. In 2022, Russia, of course, a nuclear power, invades Ukraine. Uh, and then we find out later that in the fall of 2022, there were substantial concerns about nuclear escalation between the U.S. and Russia that were kind of, I mean, under under narrated you know, in, in, in real time. And then since October last year, we've got Israel a state whose nukes we politely ignore, waging war in Gaza, committing war crimes in Gaza. And the risk was always that that kind of a war was going to spiral into a regional war. And we're starting to see signs that it kind of is. 
And as recently as this past weekend, Senator Lindsey Graham compared Israel's war on the Palestinians to America's bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He publicly, low-key, endorsed nuclear use against a people who don't even have their own state, let alone nuclear weapons. And if you recall, during the 2017 nuclear crisis with North Korea, it was also Senator Graham who was one of the leading advocates of preventive war against a then already nuclear North Korea, right? So we shouldn't be surprised by this. So we're in uh, more dangerous territory than what typically gets narrated when we read about current events. Uh, and the situation is even worse than just identifying the nuclear aspect of these ongoing confrontations, because the structures that hold up international stability have also been in secular decline, right? Regionalism, economic interdependence, arms control and disarmament regimes, it's all on the back foot or withering. And then at the same time, we're living through this resurgence of traditional sources of conflict, great power rivalry, right? Ethno-nationalism, economic nationalism, sphere of influence geopolitics. And Northeast Asia is very poorly positioned within these trends. It's a region where, as Peter mentioned, we have four states with, with nukes, uh, where the prospect of further nuclear proliferation among US allies is a very sort of real threat. And then where entrenched military commitments with, uh, you know, unresolved historical conflicts are kind of colliding with each other. It is a region experiencing what I describe in the report as uh, nuclear precarity, which is to say that Northeast Asia is a site of high structural risk, uh, which is escalating arms competition, growing first use nuclear uh, incentives, logically, and high situational risks which is uh, like a high degree of reliance on coercive military signaling, where rivals communicate with each other via thinly veiled threats or thickly veiled threats or no, no veil at all threats, right? Um, as the like predominant mode of communication. And so the question is, you know, what is to be done about all this? And call me crazy, but more nukes is not the answer. More missiles is not the answer. You know, for generations, our national security establishments have lived by some version of the ancient Roman dictum, if you want peace, prepare for war. But they've done so without any recognition that Rome was at war for most of its history. And Kenneth Boulding, the political scientist, once said, those most prepared for war usually get it. That would be a far better slogan to live by, right? We can't afford for those prepared for war to get it in a world of, of nuclear weapons, right? So again, what should be done? Well, our goal is to reduce structural and situational risks in Northeast Asia. So in effect, we wanna move uh, every competitive Northeast Asian relationship, all these different nuclear dyads, uh, we wanna move them into the bottom left quadrant of, of this matrix. It is, you know, endlessly debatable where you might place uh, any particular bilateral relationship. Uh, but the point is that only by reducing structural and situational risk can you move everybody into that bottom left corner that we might think of as like the most stable alternative future. Um, so we want to narrow the space. By doing this, we want to narrow the space for nuclear use case scenarios to arise in the first place, right? We want to reduce threats through various policy initiatives that we'll, we'll talk about. And then we also want to help better responsibly manage the what happens within the scenario should it arise. So foreclose on scenarios happening in the first place, but also help prudentially or responsibly steer uh, crises should they occur. Um, so how do we do those things? Well, the work of the, the project in year one and year two, uh, as Peter and Ava talked about, painted obviously like a pretty grim picture. And if you could summarize in one sentence what we found, you know, I would say it's that one person's deterrence is another person's escalation. And usually it was actions taken in the name of deterrence that led to deterrence failure 
and and nuclear use. And in most of the scenarios that we looked at, uh, which is sort of partially reflected here, nuclear use or nuclear escalation was the result of some combination of, of four things, right? One was miscommunication. Two, misperception, uh, both of, of enemy actions and misperception of enemy intentions. And then three, uh, overconfidence in the ability to coerce the enemy with military force. And then four, insensitivity to the decision pressures of political and military leaders uh, on the other side. So uh, our third year of the project tried to think critically about the types of policies that would be necessary to disrupt these pathways to nuclear use. And so through a series of expert consultations, working group discussions, uh, a bunch of policy papers that we commissioned all of this year three, we came up with a set of principles that respond directly to those pathways of nuclear escalation, right? These are principles that uh, we think ought to guide any action aimed at reducing the risks of, of nuclear use. Um, those principles were transparency, predictability, strategic empathy, and then rebalancing deterrence and reassurance. Uh, the first three are kind of self-explanatory, just super fast on the fourth one, rebalancing deterrence and reassurance. This is an, an insight that goes back to like the founding fathers of deterrence theory, you know, in the early days of the Cold War, you know, even people like Thomas Schelling in Arms and Influence, they, they all understood that a deterrence threat was only going to be useful or credible insofar as your, your adversary believed that if they complied with your threat, that they'd be safe. And for the U.S. in particular, but maybe more broadly, there's this tendency to obsess or optimize for uh, deterrence without any considerations about reassurance, making threats contingent if you're going to make them at all. So rebalancing that is key to our, our recommendations also. Um, yes. And so we organized what ended up being uh, a little more than two dozen, you know, substantial, thick, actionable policy proposals. Uh, we phased them in a sort of logical progression that considers their feasibility and their desired impact on risk reduction. Uh, and so we we make these recommendations that are what we call uh, warm, or I call, I don't know, warming actions, ripening actions, and then uh, reciprocal transformations. So by warming actions, we're talking about gestures that are of like a rhetorical or a diplomatic nature that entail no strategic costs. Like by themselves, warming actions do not change the balance of nuclear forces. They do not leave actors more or less vulnerable to attack, uh, but they do facilitate more meaningful actions by starting to reshape the context within which nuclear other nuclear choices might be made, right? Ripening actions are decisions that can be undertaken individually to unlock the political feasibility of future cooperation. So they help reduce risk uh, and alleviate arms racing pressures, but they don't alter the fundamental balance of nuclear forces, right? And then reciprocal transformations are bilateral and multilateral forms of cooperation. So these are initiatives that require reciprocity, some degree of mutual accommodation even, and they may or may not alter the balance of nuclear forces, but they reduce the salience or the relevance of the balance of nuclear forces. And we should aspire to live in a world where nuclear terror is not the organizing principle of strategic life. And so the recommendations kind of are presented as progressing from warming to ripening to reciprocal transformation, but they don't have to be sequenced in that way. They can go in parallel and they're kind of interdependent. And I'll talk through a couple examples very quickly of how policymakers can kind of mix and match based on you know risk tolerance or what politics permits uh, so it's not 
we have not provided like a, a checklist of actions, but it's more like a, a repertoire that policymakers can borrow from to improvise a risk reduction strategy. So one example of how you might configure a kind of risk reduction strategy based on what we've provided in the report is to focus on, you know, dialogues, right? And on the one hand, uh, sitting down and having meetings, it might amount to cheap talk, right? That's one of the, the criticisms of dialogue sometimes. Um, but on the other hand, it's bureaucratically very easy to do. Uh, it's very hard to argue against dialogues because they are fail safe, which is to say if a dialogue doesn't go well, you're generally not worse off than the counterfactual, right? And you really need to have recurring dialogues in place, including with your enemies, if you want to facilitate or unlock more ambitious policy initiatives at some point, right? So you can imagine if this is the kind of approach that a policymaker wants to take, they can they can select from warming actions, ripening actions, and reciprocal transformative actions, um, the kinds of policies that would most directly serve that approach, right? So there's a recommendation for a nuclear no first use dialogue between China and the US. This is something that both China and the US have expressed a willingness to do, right? So this is not wild eyed. Um, for years, some of us have advocated for a security dialogue with North Korea and the US, which is to say that like North Korea's foreign ministry is doesn't have a, a ton of political weight within Kim Jong-un's regime. The national security institutions within Kim Jong-un's regime have disproportionate influence. They're the ones who are most directly responsible for doctrine and force posture and strategy. And so there ought to be some discussion between our respective national security states, not just the diplomats, as a way to sort of clarify um, perceptions and intentions and what doctrine might be, right? There's a, there's a huge um, dearth of information that we, we both sides kind of would benefit from. And you can kind of go on like that, right? Um, one of the low-hanging fruit recommendations is uh, rescoping these extended deterrence dialogues that the U.S. has with Japan and South Korea, because the way these dialogues have functioned uh, over the past decade is largely as a rubber stamp to approve nuclear-capable bomber deployments to for to sign off on uh, military exercises, right? And and basically no other purpose than that. And that's inadequate. If this is actually if these kinds of dialogues are actually about stability, they they have to have a more well-rounded approach to thinking about stability, where it's not just about threats that leave something to chance, it's about reducing the risks that a nightmare happens, right? Reducing the risk that nuclear weapons be used in the first place, or that those crises emerge in the first place. So uh, a dialogue heavy approach would uh, principally focus on warming actions. But um, there are other policies within the other categories that would involve a, a heavy amount of, of dialogue. A second example might be uh, for like how policymakers might draw on this or configure this might be a, like a unilateral action approach, or you might call it like an individual restraint approach as the strategy, right? And in that case, some policy recommendations make more sense than others. Like you do what you, you do, you do what you can do, right? You don't have to be held hostage or held in check by like, what are the murky intentions of my enemy? Well, no, if you want to reduce risk, there's a lot of stuff that you as an individual government can do. And every single actor in Northeast Asia, as well as the United States, has recommendations that we put on the table. They have things that they can do to help reduce risk if that's what they want to do, right? Um, so one of the things that we talk uh, a lot about in the report is non-offensive defense Research. This is just a matter of funding and attention. You know, in the 1980s, there was a large body of literature that was intellectualizing and thinking through how to do force posture and military designs um, in ways that would provide for self-defense and collective self-defense 
but in a non-provocative way and in, in the least escalatory possible way, right? That research all got killed once the unipolar moment started. You know, the Ford Foundation in the U.S. was throwing a bunch of money at this, and then it got killed in the 90s because we were all high on our own supply of military primacy. So restraint-oriented approaches to security withered on the vine, and non-offensive defense was part of that. But over time, it would be huge to have a, a body of knowledge that advised in an alternative way of existing in the world that took security in the literal sense seriously, right? Um, an individual restraint approach, like nothing is stopping any of our governments from declaring that we will not uh, implement regime change, you know, under any circumstances, or that we will not assassinate leaders in peacetime, right? And in 2019, we came very close to declaring an end to the Korean War. Um, and it's it's within the imagination to declare mutual vulnerability with, uh, with among nuclear states who have arsenals who hold each other at risk of attack because literally mutual vulnerability is the objective condition that we exist in. It's only a question of whether we work within that constraint or try to escape it via arms racing, right? So we can imagine a world where we try to um, shape the environment by making such declarations uh, on our own in hopes of eliciting something reciprocal from, from others. And for the U.S., you know, there's so many recommendations that we have for the U.S. that the U.S. could enact on its own that would be to the benefit of regional security, that would reduce nuclear risks in the region, ranging from, you know, President Biden signing an executive order saying no nuclear capable bombers, no nuclear weapons are going to deploy to a place like the Korean Peninsula unless I say so, me the president, right? That would send a, a, a credible signal of U.S. intentions. It would help build confidence. It might generate cooperation spirals rather than conflict spirals, right? And all it takes is signing that executive order. The worst case is that, uh, you know, it does no harm, right? And there's the list goes on and on, right? Uh, so an individual restraint approach might focus on what we as individual governments can do to more favorably shape the environment. And then a third configuration, you know, maybe you could call it like a go big approach where you pursue policies that are proportional to the existential dangers that we face. So it's like, yeah, we're taking a big swing. There are some risks involved here. Um, and this is not totally in our control, but we have to try because we're on a bad path, right? So you can go through and select the kind of most ambitious proposals uh, across these recommendations. And the 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 two that I would sort of highlight uh, out of this list, you know, one is elevating the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, right? The United States needs to ratify this, but uh, a, a, a larger diplomatic campaign, probably led by Japan and South Korea, to bring North Korea into the CTBT and China and Russia as well, like that would be huge. A commitment to basically like a no first test principle, right? Uh, that would foreclose on one pathway to nuclear crisis. Um, and then in the reciprocal transformation thing, you know, when we talk about nuclear policy recommendations, we often focus on nuclear weapons per se. Right. But nuclear weapons do not exist in a vacuum. They exist in a political context. They exist in a context of non nuclear weapons as well. So, if we're going to shape the environment in a way that we allows us to actually reduce risk seriously over the long term, uh, we need to address more than just nuclear weapons per se. We need to address the context that gives rise to their salience. And so we can take a page from the nuclear freeze book in the 1980s and try a, a, a big campaign, a big swing campaign for like a advanced conventional arms freeze rather than only a nuclear arms freeze, although that would be pretty helpful too at this point. Um, and then the 2% defense conversion. I don't know if you can see it on the slide. It gets cut off a little bit on my screen, but the, there's uh, dozens of Nobel laureates have signed off on this idea of basically freezing military spending and taking 2% uh, 
for from the most advanced military nations and then redirecting it toward like UN programs and global programs that are of a planetary scale, right? So there's that's a big that's a go big approach and all of this is selecting from the same larger stock of policy recommendations. So just as a final note um I think all of these recommendations all two dozen plus they need to happen right to do them would to would be to bring to life a new kind of global order. Um I'm just realistic about how policymakers think right and the way they think is often like well what can i fold in from what you're offering uh as part of uh some approach that i want to do right so i wanted to present different ways of thinking about this same set of of recommendations um but there's a way in which in an in any analyst who has kind of like a status quo bias they might find like all of this discomforting or unworkable or pregnant with new risks but that is not a realistic reaction given the trajectory we're on as a planet. Policies oriented toward deterrence, quote unquote, whether it's increased deterrence, strengthened deterrence, restored deterrence, enhanced deterrence, those are the policies that are making the region less secure. It's what we do in the name of deterrence that makes us less secure. That is an observable fact. We're greasing the skids toward World War III and we're calling it deterrence. So in a region that's facing compounding nuclear risks, accelerating militarization, chauvinistic rhetoric, something has to be done. Minor policies of modest ambition that seek only to sort of tinker on the margins of a profound system of existential violence, that's inadequate to the task and therefore impractical. So we end the report with a call to action where we parcel out which governments ought to be responding to or implementing, you know, which recommendations. There's no way I can, this is more than I can speak through right now, right? But you get the idea. Um, happy to talk through all this, but for the sake of time, I'll just say it's all in the report. Um, so I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you, Van. Um, in the interest of time, I will turn immediately to our discussants and we'll straight away um, hand over to Professor Jun. Oh, thank you. Thank you for, for giving me an opportunity to talk about this uh, uh, excellent uh, policy report. It, it's a well uh, structured, uh, uh, well uh, thought out with uh, big pictures and, and the details and the action plans. Uh, in fact, there are too too many things to to swallow at once in its time for me. Uh, so one of the maybe suggestion uh, is that uh, I think we need uh, some little bit of uh, you know uh, kind of a forefront uh, some concept to 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 present this whole paper because it's 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 a lot of information. It's good for me to study, but uh, for the policy people. For example, you come up with the, uh, the idea of a mutual threat reduction. That's uh, also what I used often when we talk about in this inter-Korean situation. But that kind of concept could be some overall concept that, that could be uh, applied to the whole this uh, your ideas on this paper. And I just want to add a couple of points. Uh, about uh, I just want to uh, uh, talk a little bit about the structural risks in uh, on, in East Asia, Northeast Asia, and the Korean Peninsula a little bit further, so that give you some uh, more of a, a realistic uh, view of my own my own. Uh, in fact, uh, you know this uh, uh, a, a well-known bestseller uh, author uh, Tim Marshall. And in his book of uh, uh, the prison of a geography, uh, he, uh, he he allocated one chapter on the Korean Peninsula, and that that, that the very chapter beginning with uh, how do you solve the Korean problem, a problem like Korea, and then his answer is immediate answer is you don't, you just manage it, but the problem was that the management itself is uh, very difficult. We tried to manage the Korean Peninsula problem, problem during the last 30 years, but it's, it's getting worse every year. 
And who knows, maybe next uh, years, it's going to be much worse. So management itself is not, uh, uh, it's, uh, just want to emphasize that it's not easy thing. It, it, I think it was uh, because of these uh, structural risks involved in Northeast Asia and, and the Korean Peninsula. If I just only one factor in, in this Northeast, Northeast Asia is that, uh, in my view, U.S. is a status quo power. And they think the status quo is legitimate. The kind of, they were there for over 70, 80 years already. So the kind of order, regional order, military order, the kind of navigation freedom is what they are doing and that's good, that's kind of legitimate, they're right. But on the other hand, China is thinking the status quo is illegitimate. Those regional order was made when China was the weakest in its history, you know, over thousands of history. So when they are getting stronger or becoming at least the G2 in this region, they just want to have, you know, the change of the, the, the status quo. I think they will not be happy until there should be some, some change, until some structural changes. So I expect that there will be, uh, you know, unending, you know, strategic competition, nearing, uh, you know, open coming up with a very much, uh, a very, you know, very dangerous situation of a military collision. But I don't expect that uh, China and the U.S. is ready to go to war. That's a good news. But on the other hand, this uh, structural kind of confrontation is going to continue until, uh, you know, one side accepts uh, the other. I think this uh, Korean Peninsula's uh, structure, structure risk is much worse. It's uh, what I call as a unification competition. You know, all neighboring countries are engaged in a, engaged in a, in a, in a sort of a, you know, struct, you know, security competition. It's going to be either uh, a previous uh, France, Germany, or, or current uh, uh, Pakistan, India, or, or any other countries. But in case of uh, uh, two Koreas, they are engaged in a so-called unification competition. That ends only when one is removed. So I, I, you know, I think that the solution to, to this unification, uh, uh, unification competition is, I think there are two scenarios. So one is one side of fully observe the other or unify the other, or there is a, a fully settled down uh, two state system. Uh, once Korea tried when DPRK during the Cold War era, at about the end of the Korean end of war, uh, we uh, accepted the reality that the Korean Peninsula is divided. It's not going to be unified anytime soon. So we entered United Nations together and we come up with the 1991, come up with a basic agreement. So that's basically you know, the fact of to, to, to state the system. But in 1990s, North Korea had a very difficult times economically and systematically. We are more of a pursuing more you know, active or more aggressive North unification policies. Even now we are in this situation. So in that kind of uh, this uh, you know, unification competition, you know, there is a uh, there is a very unstable unstable situation in in the way that uh, uh, why it 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 just is that so? Here's a, my explanation. Both sides, you know, either South Korea or North Korea, are seeing the other side is trying to change the status quo. And also, we believe that both sides are believing that deterrence is not working effectively. It's a very unstable. Any side could break this deterrence. And also, both sides are believing that the other side is planning preemptive strike anytime, whenever feasible. And also, both sides believe that I am very vulnerable to the, the other's uh, preemptive or, or any, any attack. And also, we believe that uh, both sides believe that we are the facto uh, state of a war situation. So this truce or armistice couldn't be broken any time. 
So as long as we are in this way, I believe that uh, there will be an endless and the limitless competition between the two Koreas. So that kind of, uh, uh, I think, a situation should be uh, somehow, I expect to be emphasized, emphasized to show to the people that uh, we need uh, this kind of uh, you know, risk reduction measure is needed. And also, I just want to add a uh, uh, very short uh, couple points. In Korea, I am one of a very few experts who talk about the nuclear risk reduction issue here. You know, it, it's all about deter deterrence. After North Korea, I almost completed the, its nuclear armament. It, uh, in Korea, most you know, nuclear experts are talking about how do we deter North Korea. But still, I, in my view, you know, uh, nuclear reduction, nu nuclear, ri nuclear risk is, is such a dangerous situation. So we need to talk a lot about this, but it's not a very popular topic. And also, in order to uh, uh, you know, tackle this nuclear, nuclear problem, we also we really need to talk about this denuclearization. Without having some vision of denuclearization, you know, it's a you know nuclear risk reduction is going to be hard to be you know welcomed here. So whenever I talk about the nuclear risk reduction, people are saying that are you accepting DPRK as a de facto nuclear arming state or a nuclear weapon state? No, I don't. But somehow we need to emphasize still how are we going to pursue denuclearization, though it's going to be uh, extremely difficult. I just want to add one more last moment. Uh, you come up with a lot of uh, you know ideas about how do we restore you know uh, peace and how do we uh, initiate the nuclear risk reduction. But uh, I just want to emphasize that also you emphasize dialogue a lot. But uh, uh, I I hundred percent agree with you. But the problem was that here in Northeast Asia, uh, political and the summit approach is very important. I think we need to emphasize that. Here, you know, we are in, in you know, Japan, Korea, North Korea, South Korea, China. Uh, it, they have very traditional top-down bureaucratic tradition politics. And also, only executives and the presidents are monopolizing foreign policy. So with, without uh, their uh, direct involvement and or their you know, order, it, it, it's very hard to escape from any, you know, inertia situations. And uh, I just want to add again that I enjoy reading your uh, paper. I, I expect that we need, uh, uh, you know, we need to uh, uh, pay more attention to this paper. Thank you. Thank you, John. I'll turn now to Tong Zhan. Tong. Thank you, Shada. Um, also, thanks to uh, Peter, Eva, Van, and others for your commendable efforts to research this important issue. Um, and uh, in the year three report, uh, there is a very rich list of policy, concrete policy recommendations with uh, detailed discussions about the, you know, the reasons, uh, potential risks um, so I, I, you know, I think these these uh, recommendations give us a lot of food for thought. Um, I want to echo Evan for his uh, comment towards the end of his opening remarks that um, we need to address issues beyond nuclear weapons, um, and the ultimate measure to reduce nuclear risk is to reduce the risk of conventional war um, because nuclear war usually escalates from a conventional one. Um, and um, in addition to the risks of miscommunication, misunderstanding, um, we also face an increasing risk of deliberate aggression. Um, in the Asia, in the you know Asia Pacific region, for example, there is growing clash of fundamental interests between the major rivals uh, over Taiwan Strait. For example, where 
you know that's the most likely military flashpoint uh, in a, in in the future in this region. The, the problem is China is determined to achieve unification with Taiwan, including using force, and the U.S. and its partners are determined to prevent China from using force to achieve unification. So that's you know that's that that clash of fundamental interests and positions is the most direct driver of a major con conventional conflict that might escalate to the nuclear level. So um, I think we, we need to think more about how to tackle, how to more directly tackle this underlying rivalry, this underlying, this, this uh, you know, fundamental clash of interests. And I, I think one way to do that is for the international community to promote basic principles of behaviors, right? Uh, one common sense principle that I like to advocate is the principle of not using force to achieve, ter to change territorial status quo, right? I, I think that that's a, that, that type of principle should be widely acceptable to the international community and it should be vehemently promoted so that we, we must force the major powers to comply with such common sense principles. The lack of commitment to such principles is the great, you know, presents the gravest risk uh, to regional peace in the future. I also support the recommendation to uh, promote no first use uh, declarations and commitments. But, uh, but to do that, I think, to do that effectively, I think we need to address the conventional nuclear linkage. Um, the reason that many regional countries, Japan, South Korea included, have concerns about uh, the United States adopting no first use is that they worry uh, such a policy could embolden China's conventional level military aggression. And that's a, a serious concern. I think that's a genuine concern, which means in order to promote no first use commitments, we have to encourage the relevant parties to provide conventional level military assurance to regional players, including over Taiwan. Uh, you know, the promise of not using military force to change territorial status quo is one potential measure to provide effective, or at least to provide the minimum level of conventional military assurance. That would help promote the major powers interest, especially the American interest, in no first use policy and to reduce the opposition of Japan and South Korea against such a policy. Last comment I want to make is um, the risk of nuclear use uh, has become more imaginable today than before. If we look at Russia's recent exercise involving tactical nuclear weapons, uh, you know, fear, few of us would imagine uh, the you know realistic risk of nuclear escalation uh, in today's world, um, and here I think there is a role for the international community to play, which is is to preempt preemptively impose costs um, on anyone that might use nuclear weapons. Uh, the reason I tend to think the risk of Russian nuclear use is. Uh, uh, realistic is because once Russia uses nuclear weapons, I think the international community would immediately uh, freak out. And they will, uh, it would be so concerned about further escalation of the nuclear war, they would impose as much pressure on Ukraine and its Western supporters as on Russia. And because Ukraine and, and its Western supporters are more susceptible to international pressure due to their more democratic systems. 
Therefore, it's actually the Western countries that would uh, be, you know, face greater international pressure to make concessions in order to freeze the conflict to avoid further escalation. And for that reason, I think it might appear to Russia as actually an effective way to achieve coercive de-escalation. So that increases the use by Russia of nuclear weapons. In order to prevent such a risk from becoming real, I think it is urgent that international community needs to preemptively clarify and specify what punitive measures they are willing to impose on whoever that might use nuclear weapons in the future in order to make it abundantly clear what consequences such a perpetrator might face. Um, so far, I, I don't think we have seen enough international efforts. However, the, this project has shown that even in a limited nuclear exchange scenario, regional countries, even though they might not be directly involved in such a nuclear conflict, their interests, environment, public health will be directly affected. So I hope this project would bolster the efforts by the rest of the international community to preemptively uh, impose costs and to deter the risk of nuclear use. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tong. And I will turn straight away to Professor Higawa. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the excellent presentations and uh, also um, the comments uh, made by Professor Bonjon and uh, Dr. Ton. I pretty much agree with both of you, and it was very interesting to hear your views. And uh, I actually wanted to make two or three points uh, from the uh, about the report, but because uh, your um, comments are so inspiring, I changed my mind. And because of the time, the, the time is limited, you know, I I'm not sure whether I can uh, explain uh, enough. However, uh, first. Uh, uh, yes, the principles uh, not to use force to uh, solve pro international problems is actually, we have it already. We have it international norm or uh, international law. That is uh, UN Charter. UN Charter Article 2 prevent uh, to use uh, force to um, resolve uh, international dispute conflict. So we have already the norm first. But it does not uphold, as you know. So we already have a, a principle as international law, the first one. And then, yes, uh, the more nukes is not the answer. As uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, Van uh, mentioned, that is, you know, that is, uh, for us, that is very clear. But the problem is that there are states or leaders who do not believe so, right? That's why, because uh, remember, we have already the NPT, and NPT was formulated already how many years ago, almost 70 years ago. And in the preamble of the NPT, it's clearly stated that uh, we should avoid the nuclear war to uh, safeguard the security of the people. So we all, people weren't aware of that issue already. But we still have nuclear weapons in the world, and we are now facing a uh, building of nuclear weapons. Why is that? You know, we should think about the reason. And uh, then I uh, was thinking, you know, while I was listening to your comments or presentations, I was thinking, you know, for example, for China, Mm, the Xi Jinping already declared, I think that was in 2017, that China will replace the uh, US as a leader, the world leader. So if uh, China really thinks that uh, they want to be the leader of the world and they replace the United States, for them, maybe, you know, the nuclear weapons they already have are not enough. So they want to build up more nuclear weapons so that they can be a leader of the world. 
Yes, because Russia and the United States have uh, around uh, 5,000 nuclear weapons for each, and China, 400, 300, 400. It's not enough com to com uh, comparing it to US and uh, uh, Russian nuclear arsenals. How we can then uh, persuade China, you know, not to build up nuclear weapons while US and Russia possess? We are almost 90% of nuclear arsenals uh, in the world, right? So, and the dialogue, of course, dialogue is important. I uh, completely agree with that, uh, you know, notion. However, like uh, in 2007, 2009, officially, the uh, five nuclear weapon states uh, initiated dialogue, uh, P5 process. You know, to discuss transparency and also uh, strategic stability among the P5s. And I expected uh, uh, that uh, this process will be some kind of uh, a, a the pass uh, to the disarmament. However, it also it has also stopped. They tried. They tried to, you know, uh, place a kind of platform for the dialogue, but failed. So what we can do? We all know that you know dialogue is important. However, it is not so easy as um, uh, Dr. Ton mentioned. So uh, I, I think I stop here. I just wanted to you know somehow put questions to all of you. I have some ideas, but <laughs> I don't have enough time to talk about it today. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you, everyone, for your your comments um, and insights and and questions. Um, we actually have a couple of questions in the Q and A box, and and this is an invitation to everyone on this call. If you have any uh, comments or questions or or thoughts uh, relating to anything that's been discussed so far, please uh, feel free to add it to the Q and A. Um, so we have a couple of questions already. Um, Maria uh, Ross Rubley, hello. Um, you've added a, added a couple of questions in here. I think Van has answered one of them. Um, the other one is about uh, the problem of domestic politics and whether um, we have any suggestions on how to overcome the domestic political barriers. Um, because right now, some of the actions would um, quote unquote do harm in terms of pol political um, futures, the politicians' uh, futures. Um, do we think? For example, Biden should just be willing to take uh, the political heat for some of these ripening actions. Um, I might direct that question to Van, um, particularly given Van your 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 past life as a U.S. policymaker in the defense establishment. I think you'd be able to bring some uh, helpful um, insights to to that answer. So please, Van. Yeah. So is they're both great questions. On the first question that I sort of answered in the text box. I just wanted to say, like, on this separating structural risk and situational risk, this is kind of a way in my mind to deal both with, like, when we talk about the nuclear literature and crisis management and stuff, we talk a lot about rhetoric, signaling, communication, right, interpretation of, of the one side and the other side. All of that is, like, crisis bargaining type stuff, and that is super important. But those kinds of questions are are separate from um, the the design of an arms buildup, the defense budget, the military strategy or force posture or doctrine that gets developed. And there are those things are risky in themselves, but we don't associate those risks so much with what happens later what happens downstream like in a crisis so the the frame the the language framework that nuclear scholars have of like strategic stability equals crisis stability plus arms racing stability that's like not it's that's not wrong but it's inadequate to sort of capture how you can get compounding nuclear risks you know and so the structural and situational thing is like a way of trying to take seriously both dimensions of nuclear risk um and then on the the biden political question i don't want to cause problems for any any of the institutions on this call so i'm just speaking for myself but there is nothing more damning that biden can do with foreign policy than support a genocide right the idea that like, and to do it at the risk of his own reelection, 
nothing he can decide in Northeast Asia in order to make it more stable is going to be riskier than what's going on in the Middle East. Nothing, None of it's going to be more politically costly than this thing that's causing him to lo be losing in the polls right now to Trump. So like, I think the traditional view is that polit you know, presidents can do whatever they want in foreign policy and it will not affect their political fate. And I don't think that's quite right, but I think that's like the conventional wisdom. And what, but what Biden is showing is that he doesn't care what the electorate thinks about his foreign policy. He's just going to do his foreign policy. Like that's how I, that's how I see what's happening. So if that's, if he's just going to do whatever he thinks is right, then he needs to sit down and watch a documentary about nuclear war or whatever, because he has to develop a consciousness about nuclear risk reduction. You know, like if these policies are what's what's best, and even if it means taking a political cost, that's worth doing. But it's not clear to me that he's sensitive to political costs in the foreign policy realm anyway. And if we were having this conversation two years ago, I think it would be more debatable. But in light of Gaza, I just feel like it doesn't matter. Okay, thank you, Van. Um, another question that we have in the chat is um, from Chiquita Dishot, um, and that is what sort of reception um, stroke traction have you received, if any, for, with governments of the countries that you have identified in the report um, and made recommendations to? I will uh, direct that question to Peter Hayes um, for answer. Peter. Thanks, Shada. Um... Well, this, of course, is a three-year project, uh, and each year we've put out uh, a synthesis report that has been distributed widely through the uh, publications of the three partners in this project, uh, as well as through the scholarly journal uh, that I mentioned uh, in my opening remarks. Uh, and so in that sense, we've relied in the first two years and somewhat in the third year on the network effects or the information milieu, uh, the access to how uh, the framing of issues, if you like. The initial motivation for the project was our perception that in this region, we were in a strategic drift towards nuclear war uh, and that we needed to ring some alarm bells uh, and I think we achieved that, uh, but it's not enough to simply ring alarm bells. We wanted to go beyond that. Now, at the moment, for the, well, really for the last two years, uh, especially since the Ukraine war began, um, uh, there's been a massive increase in nuclear threat rhetoric. Uh, and in this region, of course, that includes uh, North Korea, uh, but all states have also been signaling in one way or another increased uh, reliance on nuclear threat in the form of deterrence and sometimes in the form of nuclear coercive diplomacy known as compellents. Uh, and this, I think, has caused a lot of confusion uh, in many uh, minds at many different levels, both in the government and in different sectors of society. And so what we set out to do in year three was to, as civil society voices, uh, and in an independent way, and with some moral clarity, and in an inclusive fashion, with input from all the states in the region, uh, including all the states, I, I want to emphasize that directly or indirectly, that includes North Korea, and of course, Russia, as well as China, Japan, uh, South Korea, the United States, and then many other voices uh, from the region and indeed from Europe, uh, all uh, were fed into this project. Uh, and the results are aimed not just at governments uh, of the nuclear weapon states, not just at the governments of the non-nuclear weapon states, uh, uh, but also at non-state actors who are influential, all of whom have agency, all of whom have accountability for the many different ways that we might fall uh, over the nuclear precipice. Now, in the coming 
months and year, I'm, I'm sure that there will be more specific outreach to the official policymakers via channels such as the senior members of the APLN in each country uh, to entities to fora such as the in International Group of Eminent Persons for a World Without Nuclear Weapons convened by Japan. Uh, but it's also clear that governments in, in some respects are now seeking to find some common ground uh, on these issues. Uh, the US-China dialogue, uh, which has included some of the topics on which we made policy recommendations, uh, is one such uh, shift in a positive direction since we began this project. The fact that North Korea and South Korea, as uh, Jun pointed out, now must come to terms with each other since the massive shift in North Korea's policy with the January 16th or January 18th, I'm sorry, I can't remember the exact date, speech this year by Kim Jong-un on inter-Korean relations uh, means that, that, that they too must seek uh, realistic policy measures to come to terms with the nuclear issue. And we've made such suggestions. And I guarantee that this report is circulating uh, in Pyongyang because we have the route, we have the channels to get it into North Korea. Uh, we know that Russia must change course. We don't know how this will happen, but we're certain that it will happen. The only question is when, and we've already, with our Russian counterparts uh, in the Far East, as well as in Moscow uh, and abroad, uh, have anticipated some of those moves that need to be made in this region to stabilize the situation with respect to the threat posed by Russian nuclear weapons in a variety of directions, not just against the United States. Uh, and it's also absolutely clear that in the non-nuclear weapon states, particularly Japan and Korea, that it's uh, globally, as well as regionally, uh, uh, hugely important that they reaffirm their commitment to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty uh, and uh, forswear this loose talk of nuclear sharing and the NATO model and all the rest of it, uh, let alone independent nuclear armament at this stage. So, you know, everyone has their role to play here. Uh, there's not going to be an instant or massive breakthrough. There are going to be many incremental uh, uh, attempts to move us in the right direction. And I'm pretty confident, based on what happened during the Cold War, that civil society voices will play a very critical role in defining agendas that governments ultimately uh, take up uh, with each other. Uh, and I'm sure that some of those ideas that we've put forward are already circulating uh, uh, within those uh, military and foreign policy uh, communities within each state in this region. Thanks, Shada. Thanks, Peter. Um, we have another question in the Q&A box from Charlie Jeb. Um, from DFAT. So hi, Charlie. Um, the question is, is that he is interested in views on the idea that some states may see, uh, see maintaining levels of risk and opacity as being in their interests and how this complicates efforts to reduce overall nuclear risk. Um, I'll direct that question back to, to Van. Van. Yeah, it's a good question. It's actually a super important question because uh, the, the the wizards of Armageddon, the people who are our, our nuclear experts by trade, including some of us, we've we grew up on a, a, a literature that kind of convinced us that you know deterrence was a good thing, but deterrence required exploiting and manipulating risk. The threat that leaves something to chance is is the beating heart of coercion, right? Deterrence being one version of coercion. And that I feel like has not served humanity very well, you know, like in the main, that's often an excuse, like our, our military establishments um, often embrace that kind of way of thinking, but that's a, that's completely at odds. It's a contradiction with what our governments have also publicly endorsed. I'm, I'm not sure about North Korea, but the rest of our governments have endorsed the premise, the principle, the commitment that 
nuclear wars cannot be won and should never be fought. Well, if you believe that, then you have to, you have a commitment to reduce risk. But to the extent that your foreign policies are premised on this thing you call deterrence, and certainly your nuclear policies are premised on this thing called deterrence, well, you're at odds with yourself, man. I mean, and I say this as all of our governments, like we're, we're contradictory. Our national security states are antagonistic toward our own civilizations, right? In the name of the threats that leave something to chance. So uh, we all have something to come to terms with here because there are lots of people who have uh, their fingers on the button, so to speak, who uh, believe in manipulating risk as the path to stability, but that's just a perversity argument. You know, it's, that's, 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 that's why we looked at 27 scenarios that lead to nuclear war. You know, it's that kind of thinking that greases those skids. So like we have to do something about that because there are people in our midst who make choices with our governments and our taxpayer dollars. Uh, and they're, they're thinking they need to embrace risk rather than reduce it. And we need to change that mindset. Great, and we have time for the final um, two uh, last questions from uh, Mitsuru Kitano. Um, so firstly, it's just to thank, uh, thanking us for the valuable work and two questions. First, isn't there a need to distinguish those countries who are conducting uh, aggressive behavior from those who are restraining their behavior? So that's question one. And the second question is how to influence uh, the DPRK, China and Russia to urge them to change their policy orientations. So I'll, I'll, I might just uh, turn that back to Van, if that's all right. And um, and if anyone else wants to to jump in, um, please do. But we have uh, very limited time, so I'll give uh, four minutes for that discussion, and then we'll um, have final closing remarks. Um, so so Van, please. Yeah. So this this is not a small question, but how we code categorize aggressive behavior is very problematic because like we found in the report, the project itself, you know, one man's deterrence is another man's escalation. You know, the way the region perceives the U.S., the U.S. is the aggressive power. Hegemons are by definition revisionist powers, but we tend not to talk about it that way because they're the hegemons, right? They're the ones who write rules that didn't exist before, and then they try to enforce those rules, and then they try to change those rules as circumstances dictate, right? That's that's a kind of revisionist behavior, right? To some that looks aggressive, right? But then by to the contrary, it looks very aggressive uh, when North Korea conducts nuclear tests or when China engages in uh, its maritime militia in the South China Sea or something like that. But um, for the most part, this is not aggressive. Like for China, the aggressive behavior is not nuclear behavior. And with North Korea, the aggressive nuclear behavior is in the realm of testing, which is why the CTBT is a very useful initiative, right, to curb that, um, if we could get North Korea on board with it. So the aggression thing is hard to categorize. It's very subjective. How to influence China, North Korea, Russia. I think that U.S. is pretty crucial here because the U.S. is the dominant power militarily. I mean, on some level, politically as well. And there's a huge literature in security studies that shows how the when you have an imbalance of power, it's the stronger power that has to make accommodations and compromises first in order to credibly signal to the smaller powers that they're going to be willing to address their needs, right? communicating commitment problems and information problems in a credible way and resolving those. And every time we engage in negotiations with a smaller power like North Korea, if we're expecting reciprocity, but we haven't done the unilateral work first of making certain accommodations to take seriously their own strategic concerns, we're sabotaging those negotiations. And that's been the history for the past 30, 40 years. There's a very large literature about this. Like it's not, it shouldn't be that controversial, but in policymaking circles, this is a foreign literature. Nobody talks about this, even though it's logically obvious. So the stronger power has to move first. Then we can expect reciprocity maybe. Um, so that's how I think we influence them by dealing with ourselves first. 
Great, thank you. I know that Peter wants to come in briefly on the question about uh, maintaining list, uh, levels of opacity and how that complicates uh, the risk reduction efforts. Um, so Peter, you have one minute. Thanks, Shadow. Well, it, it's actually more want to come in on risk taking, uh, just to make the, the sort of generic point that uh, high levels of risk taking, particularly by relatively small, weak nuclear weapon states like North Korea, to me bespeak more of an attempt to substitute nuclear threat uh, for conventional force uh, and to reveal their inferiority in the conventional dimension. And the policy implication of that is that we desperately need to put back some military to military stabilizing agreements of the kind that we had in place from 2018 until last year when they were abandoned by both North and South Korea. Uh, and then relatedly, um, I think that it's unrealistic for the United States to think that a country like North Korea is going to give up what it sees as being nuclear aggression unless the United States is to actually willing to engage in a relatively co-equal manner uh, on adjusting its strategic posture in ways that were under discussion in the past, but were never actually uh, implemented in any meaningful fashion. It will be a two-way street, not a one-way street. But what is critical to this actually is South Korea now take the leadership with North in the dialogue with North Korea of these matters, because North Korea has now declared South Korea to be its primary enemy. And there is no one else as a primary interlocutor other than Seoul for these discussions uh, in the future. And the United States will have to adjust depending on the uh, views of the South Korean leadership. Right. Thank you, Peter. Um, so I'll now turn to Dr. Fumihiko Yoshida, who is the director for the Research Center for Nuclear Weapons Abolition at Nagasaki University, uh, for closing remarks. Professor, please. Thank you, Shata, and everyone who participated in this important workshop. Well, we did the best for this policy recommendation. As you know, no policy information cannot be perfect, but it is good. Uh, it can stimulate many discussions, inspirations, and ideas, whatever. I think that happened today. We all saw that and listened to that. So uh, to me, uh, I learned uh, you know, new keywords from today's discussion, like uh, Aban said, uh, we need to you know, look for a more stable alternative future. That's very important in, the, in general. I also we need to focus on more, we need to pay more attention to the discussion on overconfidence in nuclear deterrence. That is also important. And also rebalancing deterrence and reassurance. That's, that is really, very important also. But from Tom, I learned that I now have a feel the same as you. Uh, how are we gonna stop the second strike after the first use? So that means no first use, no first use is important. Also, the critically important, no second use option to prevent escalation. So that we try to you know uh, challenge that point, but we didn't have time yet for that. So we still have homework. But anyway, uh, the three-year project did uh, uh, have produced good achievement, I believe. And uh, considering today's situation, I believe uh, uh, the product we left will inspire, you know, uh, ourselves, but also uh, the people who read or saw uh, our product. So thank you very much. All the the the, the, uh, the you know the persons who involved engaged in this project and also the persons who participated in this uh, today's workshop and also the APRN staff who worked on all of the project for, for our project and also for today's workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us at, at today's webinar. Uh, thanks to all the speakers, to all the discussants, um, to all the staff and all the, the project organizations involved in this initiative. And you can find uh, the papers on the APLN, REGNA and Nautilus Institute websites. 
And please get in touch if you have any questions or uh, further you'd like further information. Thanks for your time and goodbye, everyone. Thanks, Tom and uh, Professor Drew. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah, have a good day. Thank you. Bye.